Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to the student portion of the symposium. Um, before I get started, just introduce myself. My name is Jackie Cho. I'm a third year dual master student, so I'm doing a uh, master's in public policy and also a master's in planning. Uh, and we went to Varanasi with ideas about what sort of problems the city faced. And our purpose to going to the city was to really understand the city not just as a physical entity, which was difficult enough as it was, but also as an entity that was composed of people, and people who are changeable and different, and all have different opinions and ideas, and also have to have agency as well. And so we spent a little over a week in Varanasi and had the opportunity to speak with residents, with community leaders, uh, academics, scholars, and we also had the opportunity to speak with the Varanasi Municipal Corporation as well. And to take those ideas and those inputs and understanding how they thought about their city and what they thought the problems were and how you would fix those types of problems and using those to inform the kinds of solutions that we had come up with for problems that we had identified. And then we went next to Ahmedabad and we presented at SEP University to a panel of the professors there the solutions that we had come up with for Varanasi's problem. And we got th that input as well. And so luckily for you, you're at the tail end of that whole process. And so you get a little bit of everything that we got while we were in Varanasi. So personally, I looked at water stress in Varanasi. This is, of course, not a problem that is unique to Varanasi. It is a problem that all cities face, and developing cities in particular. And Varanasi sort of has a huge comprehensive problem when you're talking about water. So baseline, they have a contamination and pollution issue for their water. Uh, but on top of that, their infrastructure is aging. So the last update that was that happened to the water infrastructure and the sewage infrastructure in Varanasi occurred in 1984. Uh, it hasn't been well maintained since then, and so the, the infrastructure is old, it's aging, it's not well maintained, and it also results in tainted distribution. So in the best case scenario, where the water is cleaned perfectly at the water treatment plant, at the point where it leaves that water treatment plant and it reaches the water pump in the village or the city or you're taking it into your house, it's been recontaminated because the sewage lines are leaking, the water lines are leaking, and so even the groundwater is being contaminated because of the infrastructure problem. Uh, and on top of that, there's also insufficient storage in Varanasi. So for a city of about one million people, there are only 21 storage tanks that are located throughout the city to service all these people. Uh, and on top of that, we've got storm drainage problems. We have annual flooding. Uh, my solutions, I specifically only looked at the first four problems, which were sort of big enough on their own. I didn't really look at flooding and storm drainage with something one of our other classmates took the time to look at. So kind of to give you an understanding of the scope of this problem, Varanasi receives 45% of its water from the Ganga River. And the Ganga River at Varanasi is basically at its most polluted point along the entire river. So this is a table that shows you uh, water samples that are taken at different ghats in Varanasi. So ghats are basically stone steps that lead from the city and allow people access directly to the Ganga River. So at the ghats in Varanasi, you'll see people uh, using that for access to get to boats. You'll see people doing laundry, bathing, brushing their teeth, water rituals. And this is also where the cremations occur in Varanasi. So samples are taken along Varanasi, and no, no single sample that was taken in the vicinity of Varanasi met Class B standard. So Class B standard is a bath water standard. It's not even for drinking water. Uh, at the most polluted point in Var Varanasi at Varuna Ghat, which is one of the main Ghats, uh, the average biochemical oxygen demand exceeded the standard for Class B water by 50 15 times. So biochemical oxygen demand is a measurement that's used to assess how many bioorganisms are needed to clean the water. It's the oxygen that they output. And so exceeding the limit by 15 times means the water is pretty uh, pretty problematic. The average fecal coliform uh, level in Varanasi at Varuna Ghat exceeds the standard by over 86,000 times. So this is a big problem. And so that's sort of the scope of what we're looking at. And the reason why this is such a problem is because there are multiple sources of contamination in, in Varanasi. We've got tourists, we have slum dwellers, residents, industry, we have the rituals, and we have agriculture. And so this isn't a simple one stop, we just need to stop the runoff, or we need to prevent people from dumping their industrial runoff. This is a really multifactorial problem. 
And so thinking about that, the first part of our course and the part where we are here at USC, we spent a lot of time doing research. So looking into interventions that have taken place all over the world, thinking about different approaches that people have taken to solve their water stresses, water shortages, water overabundance, uh, cleanliness of water. And I really hit upon three main approaches to the strategies. So the first one was a short-term solution, which was household water treatment and safe storage. The second option was something that would need a little bit more time, so a near-term solution, and that was small-scale water systems. And the last option is sort of the most evident option that sort of hits you in the face, which is a long-term solution where you a complete overhaul of both the infrastructure, so the nuts and bolts of the water system, and the administration, so the management, the people side of the water system. But since that, that something like that would take years to implement, I felt it was important to supplement with things that could happen in the immediate and the near term. Uh, today, I'll only be discussing my short-term so, uh, solution for time constraint issues, and just to kind of give you a taste of the process that we went through and the understandings that we came to while we were in Varanasi. So household water treatment and safe storage is one of the most popular water interventions that's used worldwide. And the reason for this is it's the most cost-effective water intervention that has been used, and it's one of the few water interventions that has been clearly documented to decrease disease incidence and decrease uh, incidence of diarrhea. So it's been used, and you can see here in Kenya, Mozambique, but it's really been used worldwide in places where there are water shortages, and in places like um, countries like India, where they have a wet season and a dry season. So the basic the basic fundamental idea behind a household water treatment and safe storage system is to treat the water at the point of use. So for a city like Varanasi, where there is a water supply, so we have the ganga, we have the storage tanks, we have the uh, hand pumps that are all over the city, but the distribution is tainted so you can't trust that water no matter where you're getting it. Uh, you treat it when you pick it up. You take it home and you treat it there and you store it and this is also the key part of the household water treatment and safe storage system is the safe storage part. So you have to make sure the water is not going to get recontaminated after you've uh, treated it. So this is sort of the big picture idea for what, it would, what you would do with a household water and safe storage uh, system. I'm happy to answer more questions about this in particular or any other strategies when we get to the question section. But in the meantime, I'll move on to sort of the next step. Uh, so for us, going to Varanasi was a, was a process of thinking about our assumptions and then checking to see if they were right. So for me to think, okay, a household water and safe storage treatment is important, I'm assuming a lot of things about how water is used in Varanasi and how people think about their water. One of the things that we had assumed based on a lot of the literature that we had been reading was that there was going to be a lot of misunderstanding about how polluted the Ganga River was. So if the Ganga River is a very sacred area in India, in Varanasi in particular, and there are a lot of ideas about the Ganga River being cleansing and self-cleansing. And so one of the things I thought was going to be the most difficult thing about getting people on board with the idea of needing to treat water was that they would believe the Ganga River to be clean already. Turns out everybody in Varanasi, everybody we spoke to, including our rickshaw drivers, had a very clear understanding that it was incredibly polluted and should not be used to drink. <laughs> that, <laughs> that notwithstanding, they were still using the water because there's just only so much that you can do. Uh, what, was, what we did find to be true was that people did not understand that the groundwater was not clean. And so one of the things that we kept hearing was that, oh, the Ganga is really polluted, but it's fine. We use the hand pumps. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, that's still not a good idea. It's still incredibly polluted. Um, and so that was one of the things that we found to be true when we went to uh, Varnas. We still saw problematic water storage. We saw that people were still using high levels of contaminated water and that there was really problematic sanitation and sewage disposal um, in Varanasi. The thing that we found uh, not to be true, that we had thought to be true based on our readings of background research was that there was going to be a lack of water distribution. At least in the places in the areas of the city that we went to, including the slums, there was a lot of access to the, um, the formal water structure. So there were hand pumps just about everywhere you went. Um, in an ideal world, we would have gone out further into Varanasi, into the more rural areas, to see if this continued to be true. But given the time constraints, we weren't really able to make that particular verification. So with those understandings of how people perceived water and how that was being used and how it was being transmitted. The 
these were sort of the key elements that I thought would be important if we were to actually implement a household water treatment and safe storage system in the city of Varanasi. So the first step in all this, in this system, in every city that it's ever been taken to, is education. So you need to convince people that the water is dirty in order for them to want to clean it. And you also have to treat, help teach them how to do it, to convince them that it's doable and that it's important to keep it, not just to clean it in the first place, but to keep it safe in appropriate storage. The second step was obviously to get safe water vessels. So one of the most common things that um, we saw people using to store water in, in the households and also in businesses and in firms was just a bucket. And they would have a cup and you just scoop it in and scoop it out. So if you imagine that every time you open that bucket and you put in the cup, you're contaminating the water all over again. And so that was something that was really important, was to think of the idea of what is a safe storage vessel that could be used in India, that works with the culture, but is also something that is reproducible and cheap enough that it's accessible to everyone. And so the last element of implementing a system like this would be the behavior shift. So what I mean by that is actually seeing these things in use using the storage vessels, treating the water, and not using the Ganga River for anything other than ritual, for ritual water use. And the last element is something that I'll be discussing a little bit more in depth, but the idea of having personal responsibility for the water. And this is something that we were hearing over and over again with all our discussions, and something that the uh, faculty at SEP thought was really important, was the idea that the people themselves were responsible for their water, and that they couldn't rely on anyone else to keep it clean for them. And so this is a theme that I think we've heard with a lot of our speakers today and we'll continue to hear with the students, but the idea of agency. And so we're thinking about some key takeaways for how we engaged in Varanasi. The first thing that we had to think about is when you want to engage in a city like Varanasi, in a country like India, it's not a given that, there's, that the systems will be accountable, that agencies will be accountable, uh, that municipal corporations even will be accountable, and it's also not a given that there's gonna be sustainability. And so it's important in the things that we kept hearing and things that we saw, especially with the water systems, is that you can build it, but if you don't put in a formalized system for accountability and people don't know who they should call, then those things start to break down. So one of the problems with Varanasi is that the management of the water system is actually managed by two organizations and it's not clear which organization has responsibility for what and so when people have problems they don't know who to call uh, and sustainability as I mentioned before there was an overhaul of the system in 1984 but there wasn't a, a sustainable way to keep that system running and operating and so those are two important elements that in the country like the United States in a city like like Los Angeles might just happen on their own but in a city like Varanasi we have to really think about actively building in those things at the ground level. And lastly, the thing that we thought was most important was this idea of empowerment and agency and identification of responsibility. So one of the things that we are hearing most commonly echoed in Varanasi is that I understand this is a problem, but it's not my responsibility. Someone else is going to take care of this. And, and an additional layer of that was mysteriously that well, I also don't trust the person who's supposed to take responsibility for this. And so, it's sort of this weird kind of passing the buck situation that we saw is that the residents didn't trust the municipal corporation, who didn't trust the state level government, who probably in turn didn't trust the federal government, who likely didn't trust anybody. But at that level, sort of nobody is doing anything because nobody feels like it's their responsibility and they also don't feel like they can trust the people that, they sh that should be taking responsibility. And so when we think about engage in a city like Varanasi and something even as basic as providing clean water, the, the idea really is to empower people to act, to take ownership over their own actions and take control over things that are in their sphere of power and to get them their clean water and that they can do it at an individual level. So I'd like to thank Professor Barney for giving me the opportunity to speak today. And I'd like to pass it off to David Shea, who will discuss a little bit more about our experiences. So hello, I'm David Shea. I am a second year master's in planning student. Um, my project dealt with floor area ratios and their potential uh, in Varanasi. But I'm going to start with my general reactions to Varanasi as a city and kind of what led me to pick floor area ratios as a strategy for potentially helping solve some of the problems uh, in this really ancient city. City. Um, I think our first intro in this class to the city was first of all learning about the incredible history of this ancient city. You know, it's the center of Hindu.
Hinduism. Uh, the, the Ganges is considered sacred, as we've heard. Um, but also, this comes with a lot of problems because it's, it was built long before you know, planning was even really a concept. It came up really informally. It's incredibly dense. It has all these rituals that we were told we couldn't touch. And a kind of a street level activity that happens on an informal level and a formal level, kind of chaos in a, in a certain perspective from a Western perspective. And so really, I think initially what we had to overcome was this kind of defeatism where, okay, well, Western strategies aren't going to work, and this is hopeless. Uh, and this is something that Professor Barney kept hammering home. He said, look, you guys are Westerners. They're going to be critical of you coming over there and, and you know, throwing strategies at them. But you have to fight through that because there's ways to take what we have learned in the West as planners and apply it to a city like this. And there is a way that he believed, and he really spread this passion to us, that you know, we could find this middle ground where we could have some effect and could start to create change. So he suggested to me, why don't you look into floor area ratios? And I thought, my god, that is the most boring thing anyone could ever, you know, ever suggest. And as it turned out, it was actually fascinating. So for those of you who don't know, floor area ratio is basically, if you have a lot, your floor area ratio is your floor, total floor area compared to the lot size. So if you're told that you can only build to an FAR of one, that means that if you build out to your full property lines, you can only build one story. Now, as you see from this diagram, if you only build to 50% of the lot area, then you can build to two stories, and so on and so forth. But what you have to remember is that this is a limited tool. It's, it's aimed, at least in the Western standpoint, at controlling density. But it only does so much, because if you have a very large plot, obviously, it's, it's fairly uncontrollable. And yet it's become kind of ubiquitous in planning circles as kind of an enforcement tool to tr and, and to alleviate community fears over these kind of towering, giant, dense buildings that would blot out the sun. Um, so then I set out and trying to figure out, OK, well, if that's the Western standpoint, what's going on in India? And what com kept coming up time and time again in the Times of India was this issue in Mumbai, because they're really the pioneers of what they call floor space index, but which is the same exact uh, notion and the same exact planning tool. Basically, in Mumbai, there's this problem with incredible overcrowding, both indoors and outdoors. And the, the municipal government got together and said, OK, if we set very low floor area ratios throughout the city, then people will uh, stop building. And that's a good thing, because they thought, OK, if there's less places for people to stay, there'll be less people. And there'll be less crowding, which seems like a reasonable thing. Uh, so they set the limits at to one and two throughout the city, and were very, very rigid about it. But the unintended consequence was that people just stopped building. Development was totally stunted, and migration to the urban areas did not stop. People kept coming in, so what happens is they lived in informal slum dwellings that didn't have infrastructure, that didn't have you know, water, electricity, anything. So then they kind of went back and said, okay, well, we have to retool this, this system. And they again looked to the West and saw that in some areas, in some cities, they were actually having a transfer of floor area ratio, where if you didn't reach the limit that was set, then you could sell off your extra floor area to another developer who could build higher. But the problem with this, this uh, transfer development rights scenario that they set up, as they called it, TDR, was that they didn't allow a lot of flexibility. They said, OK, only in certain parts of the city can you sell off your unused FAR, and you can only build to an FAR of 2.5. So you only have an additional area of 0.5 FAR to build to. And it really didn't solve many of the problems because it was incredibly rigid. And also, there was no way to ensure that people built to any density at all. Because remember, this is just a cap. So what happened was people were just selling off their unused FAR to get quick cash. And developers in out the outskirts of the city, in areas that already had good infrastructure, were just building higher. So it was, it was an enlightening case scenario, but it wasn't necessarily totally positive, obviously, because it, it, the outcome wasn't great. But at least it said that they were trying, they're willing to use FAR as a tool to potentially guide development. But in a way that's very different from the Western standpoint, because again, it was about fixing crowding. So I went back and I looked at uh, LA and tried to figure out what they were doing that was innovative in LA. And I found the uh, Los Angeles Cornfield REO specific plan, which is being built in just north of, uh, or is being planned for just north of Chinatown. And it's still kind of mogged down in uh, the planning commission process. But basically, it proposes these different areas in a part of the city that is 
either uh, greenway along the river or is light manufacturing that has largely become vacant over the years. But what it aims to do is create uh, an urban center that was supposed to be denser and then uh, two other zones, the urban innovation zone and the urban village zone, each with its own different FAR limit, and then create a very low FAR limit in this greenway zone around the river. So you can see here that the different FAR bases that they created um, to try and control density and direct it in certain parts of the city, but keep it away from this greenway, which was supposed to maintain its low-lying, kind of underutilized character. So I thought, okay, well then, in, in Varanasi, which is a city that has had, you know, it has this dense, dense urban core, but wants to still create development on the outskirts, well, this could be a tool. Because if you set up a transfer system with different FARs in different areas, then you could stymie new development in the old part of the city, the city that you, part of the city you want to protect, but still encourage it elsewhere. And you could have capital flowing into the old part by the old, the, by developers in the old part of the city selling off their unused FAR to developers outside the city. But of course, I had to go to Varanasi and see if this would even work. So we met with Nagar Nagam, which is the municipal corporation. And we sat down with the, the, the municipal uh, commissioner. And I basically pitched this idea to him. And he said, look, I spent all day fighting fires, as he called it. I get calls all day about building code, about this and that. We don't have time to consider something like this, nor do we even have the authority, because the authority actually belongs to the Varanasi Development Authority, the VDA, which they don't communicate with. So there was this huge problem of these kind of warring you know, municipal, municipal officials that really didn't know what the other one was doing. And here the commissioner is throwing up his hand saying, I don't know, I have too much going on. And the, the most input we got out of that meeting was actually from two activists and that had just come of their own admission who were kind of elites within the society, but very, very intelligent. And basically what uh, Navneet Rahman, one of the, these activists said, he said, look, you can't get rid of FAR altogether. If you get rid of FAR, you take the teeth away from the tiger. But there is a way to work within this system. And they said, you know, good luck, basically, uh, in almost a cynical way, because they thought an idea like this really, it might work in a theoretical sense. But in a city like this, it's too, chaos to use, too chaotic to use a tool uh, in, this, in this fashion. So I looked at what the reality was in, in the city. And if you see here, it's not just the fact that there's a sacred city, but there's, there's also this problem of in, incredible congestion and informal street vending, which you see up in the right-hand corner, which isn't necessarily a problem, but it's something you have to work around. And I wanted to meld this kind of authentic, organic culture street level that was happening in Varanasi with some of the new development that was happening on the outskirts, like this one, which is uh, in Sigra. Uh, a neighborhood of Varanasi. It's exactly what the city didn't want to have happen, which is these high-rise residential buildings that are cut off from the street. Uh, you can see there, there's no interaction with this, the street. There's no area for informal vending going on. It's exact scenario where new development is just kind of going to pave over the authentic culture of Varanasi. Exactly the scenario you don't want to have happen. So I then sat down and tried to figure out a way to work around all this. And I came up with basically three hypothetical zones. Now this is very, very, very rough. Um, but whereby the old city would have a, a kind of higher base FAR and maximum FAR um, that mimics the density that's existing there. But again, we didn't want a lot of development there. So in order for, uh, for oh, excuse me, I have to go back and explain that part of what was uh, very, very innovative about the Los Angeles plan was it allowed you to have bonuses. So you could actually improve your cap on FAR and go above the cap if you did things like build uh, community parks, open space, and the like. So I took that in and included that in this plan and said, OK, um, well, so you could set a, a base FAR and a max FAR that you can go up to if you do these extra things that the city wants to see. But again, we don't want development to have happen in the old city. So in order to actually build there, this plan would mandate that any new development would have to pay for the cost of additional infrastructure, pipe, new piping, water, the et cetera. So basically, it would mean that no one's going to try and build a new building. But what they will try and do is infill old buildings. And the plan allows that. Now, in the outskirts of the city, they would be similarly capped with a base FAR limit and a potential max FAR limit they could go up to if they did these additional community benefits projects, such as parks, et cetera. 
But th if they wanted to purchase uh, a different additional FAR, then they could do so within their own zones. So each zone could trade with de another developer who wants to go you know, beyond his, his, his base level FAR. But anyone is allowed to, use, uh, to buy unused FAR from the old city. So basically what it does is it sends capital from these outskirts into the old city and funds the infill development there. So that was the basic strategy. And you know, it's, it's an uphill battle in a place like that because we pitched, I pitched this idea to SEPT. And they're stuck in a lot of the same thinking that's actually stymieing uh, thinking in Los Angeles, which was, well, what about, you know, are you thinking about setback requirements? And I kept saying, no, 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 this isn't looking at design. This is looking at FAR. It's just a plain strategy for density. Leave design for something like a design guideline. And they kept thinking in this old way of planning thinking, which is we want to control design, which is always what FAR you know, it's secretly been about, it, I, at least I think from a cynical viewpoint. Um, so, you know, it was uphill battle and it was a grapple, but it was great kind of getting their feedback. They thought it was really interesting. One of the professors there actually said, you know, I have been researching not just an FAR transfer system, but an FAR transfer system that basically sells off this unused FAR between developers, almost like a stock. So instead of one developer just selling off his unused uh, floor area space to another developer as a direct transfer, basically you could put it out in the free market and it would be like uh, you know, a market trade. So there are some really great ideas came out of it and again this is an ongoing discussion that we're having with them but it, uh, I think it led to some fruitful thinking so thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Winnie Fong. I am a first year uh, Masters of Planning student here at Price and um, last month our planning studio went to uh, Tokyo, Japan and um, part of my research prior to going to um, Japan was studying um, love hotels in Japan. Um, and today I will talk about how um, love hotels became a part of Tokyo's urban centers um, in terms of where they are located as well as their architectural design and um, their relationship to the streets. So what are love hotels? Love hotels are basically short stay establishments where married and young dating couples come to spend a few hours, such as two or three hours, to engage in sexual activity. Um, mostly because they lack the privacy to do it at, in their own homes. And the reason why they lack privacy in their own homes is because um, in Japan, um, they live in very compact spaces. The rooms are very small. And in addition to that, their walls are um, constructed very thinly, so it's not as soundproof. Hence the reason why they frequent these love hotels um, in the city. Love Hotel is also a very, very huge uh, industry. There are about over 30,000 Love Hotels um, all over uh, the country in Japan. And before it had a negative connotation uh, as it was uh, used to be associated with prostitution. But um, over the decades, it has been a more an acceptable place for um, couples to spend some alone time together. And um, so basically, what is the characteristic of a Love Hotel, as you can see, um, in this picture, uh, usually the architecture is very flashy, it's showy, the flamboyant in colors, um, and also uh, the rooms, uh, they're typically furnished with the bed, as well as other amenities to help the couples entertain each other, such as karaoke or um, a jacuzzi. So um, prior to going to Japan, I did some research um, to find out where they were located. Um, in terms of location, I think it's important to understand um, how streets work in Japan. So um, there are two distinguished pathways, the Omotodori and the Uridori. The, um, the Omotodori is basically the, uh, the main thoroughfare, as you can see um, in the solid blue line and in this photo here in Shibuya. Um, omote in Japanese literally means front. So as you can see, um, it's mostly all the tall businesses and offices located in front of the street. And the streets are typically wider, so it accommodates the flow of traffic for the pedestrians and automobiles. And, um, and it's usually very busy. Contrary to the omotodoris are the uradoris. Ura mean, in Japanese literally means back. So these are the, um, the back streets uh, located right behind um, the front streets. As you can see here, they are um, in the dashed line in this area. As you can see in this photo, um, 
the roads are typically more narrow, it's more intimate, it's quiet, um, and more traditional. So I think one of the struggles I had in, prior to going to Japan was that um, uh, the urodoris here, um, they, the roads tend to wind in every direction. Um, so it was very, it's very hard for um, the Japanese to give these street names proper name, street names. So to pinpoint where these hotels were located on a map was very difficult. Um, so when I went there, I just basically went on a limb and just walked randomly hoping I would find um, love hotels. And as a colleague had mentioned, um, you know, these alleyways, they kind of leave us with an element of surprise. You'll never know where these alleyways will lead you to. And in this case, it led me to my very first love hotel um, in this corner um, alleyway. Um, as you can see here, it's a uh, very flamboyant, it's very pink, it's extreme, and whatnot. You can tell um, it's a love hotel. Um, and walking along this main corridor, um, I went to another alley and I saw more love hotels. As you can see, these buildings, they kind of conform more around the buildings and its surroundings. And um, so at this point, I was starting to get a little bored. Um, and until I reached this end of the road and I saw this building, um, I think it's a sex business establishment. So I thought, okay, maybe I'll see some more love hotels around here. So I walk further and I see this, um, down this alleyway right here, I see the stairway going up. And I thought that's pretty interesting because normally I don't see stairways going in an alleyway. And then I see this lovely couple walking down and I thought, oh, maybe they're possibly coming down from a love hotel. So um, I decided to go up and to see what was up there, and surely enough, I hit jackpot. Um, this, I think I discovered the infamous Love Hotel Hill um, in Shibuya. And you can see here in this road, it's just a long roadway with just Love Hotels left and right, one after another. And um, I kept walking, and you can see there was a lot more curving towards the end, and you can see more um, love hotels, uh, the pictures here. Um, and um, I was able to go back to the drawing board. Um, I, based on my notes and my pictures, I decided to map out where all the love hotels were in this area, in this particular vicinity. And um, having spent a week in Japan, um, I was able to assess the surrounding areas. Um, in Shibuya, and in, in this corner of the road is where um, all the retail and shopping is. The famous um, Shibuya 109 department store is located here, and right behind it is this uh, entertainment district where all the bars are located at, and all the karaoke, and right behind it is where um, all the love hotels are situated um, and scattered around. And what I can surmise from this is that, you know, people from the offices are shopping, and they come and they hang out, have fun, they go to the bars, and towards the night they eventually migrate towards these love hotels. So after spending um, some, some time in Japan, I, decide, I began to develop some, um, some clues as to how to differentiate uh, and identify these love hotels, and one of them was signage. Um, as you can see here, uh, in the love hotels, they typically have a sign sitting um, on the street. And, and you can tell it's a love hotel because it provides two rates. One is a short term or short stay rate, and the other is an overnight uh, rate. As you can see here, um, a short stay is about 2,500 yen, which is equivalent to $25 for like about two to three hours. Um, and it can range up to 600 yen, which is $60 for an overnight stay. And um, in addition to the price of the hotel, they also provide pictures of what the room looks like inside. So um, when patrons walk by, they can see how much it costs and see what the rooms look like. If they like what they see, then they can go um, inside and reserve the room on site. Secondly is privacy. Um, uh, patrons who uh, frequent these hotels tend to be very discreet about their visits. And one of them is um, uh, the build or the hotels are built where they separate the entrances and their exits. So you can never see the patrons coming in and out of the same area. 
Uh, in this case, um, you see they have these walls built that separate the street from the door. Um, and I think it allows patrons to kind of go walk down the alley, disappear in there, and um, so people can't see them walk physically walk through the door of these love hotels. Secondly, are our windows. Some of them don't really have windows, as you can see in this hotel. And I believe it's because um, uh, love hotels allow Japanese couples to kind of escape from the day-to-day -day reality and into this fantasy world. So uh, the fact that they don't have windows kind of shuts them away from the busy city life um, that's on, on the outside. And which leads us to this um, contradiction where, you know, if they're so discreet about their visits, then why, are, why is the architecture so showy and flashy and gaudy? And in this case, it's blatantly out in the open. Um, I took this photo off of the Yukasadani platform um, in the train station, and you can just see there's a slew of um, love hotels just out in the open. Um, and later I found out it's because they want um, people to know uh, that, hey, we have love hotels here. If you want to come, then you can just exit off this train station and follow the signs and lead you to these hotels. And in this case, you can kind of see uh, the love hotels are still situated in the Udodoris and the back alley streets, and they're never situated um, in the main thoroughfare. And this is another one where you can see a uh, love hotel across the street from a temple. Um, which leads me to this conclusion. Um, I believe that love hotels are very unique because it allows Japanese couples to express intimacy um, in the public realm. And what I found, um, having gone to the visit, I, at first my perception were I thought love hotels were these seedy, inappropriate facilities. But honestly, it just it kind of blends in with the urban fabric um, and the urban landscape because it functions as a practical purpose, um, and it has been embraced in the Japanese culture because you know they lack the privacy to do stuff like this at home. And I illustrate this point with this photo um, here. I was able to follow these two old ladies dressed in traditional kimonos walking up the street with four big love hotels like it's nothing. Um, so I, I want to conclude that it will be interesting in, to see how love hotels play out in the future as we see some demographic shifts and um, social phenomenons such as declining birth rates. Um, statistics have shown that Japanese aren't having um, enough sex and also the social um, phenomenon of herbivore men where men my age are not interested in uh, marriage or dating. Um, really quickly, um, uh, the other part of my project in Japan was um, mapping Tokyo in time. And I did so through the lens of the urban bike culture, where I captured uh, video footage and also photographs of people who ride, who rides bikes, where they ride them, and also their bike infrastructure. And from that, um, we had a site area here. Um, uh, my Basically, my strategic intervention was to bring a bike share program to um, increased accessibility of people coming to the site in this area. And um, basically a bike share is a shared use service which allows people to check out a bike using this kiosk and they get to ride it for a short amount of time and then they can return it um, uh, into any other station in the network. And I feel like this would also help reduce illegal parking, bike parking in the area and also um, got the crowded train stations. And um, here's one that I saw in Yokohama that's existing in Japan. And later I found that there was an existing bike share in Shibuya uh, where our site was, but as you can see, it doesn't have the, exhibit the um, traditional elements of a bike share. It doesn't have a kiosk where you can go and rent a bike, and also doesn't have these docking stations. So from, from being there, I, you know, I wasn't able to tell what, what this was, and um, so my intervention would be to um, improve their bike share program and also um, strategically place them in areas um, all over the site. So um, that concludes my presentation. So in light of time, I'm going to um, kind of go through this uh, pretty quickly, but I do want to just make a, a brief mention of um, the kind of the 
uh, one of the the kind of different approach that uh, we were taking with uh, this class, the, J the Japan Studio, uh, because we actually went to, rather than uh, kind of going to Japan with our proposals and our interventions planned out um, and going and presenting them there, what we were doing uh, was we actually went to the trip uh, in the middle of the semester um, and we kind of well, went about engaging the city in three alternate ways. Uh, in the first way, uh, we were all exploring uh, in kind of academic uh, research papers uh, a theme, a uh, phenomena of the city. And we all did various things. Uh, Winnie's was the, uh, the, the love hotel. Some folks did various aspects of nightlife and, and fashion. Um, and kind of the, the smallness of, of living spaces and uh, explore those themes to kind of educate ourselves about the phenomena of the city. And then when we went to the city, we all prepared uh, creative mapping projects to visualize the city in time. And one of the things that uh, Professor Barnet was uh, uh, explaining to us and trying to get us to think about was because Tokyo is the city that has kind of rebuilt itself over and over again uh, rapidly over the years um, and uh, so that it's hard to judge this city uh, by, the, by the built form alone because it's constantly in flux, it's constantly changing. So one of the challenges he gave us was to find creative ways to visualize that city in time. Uh, so, um, and then the third thing we were doing while we were there was trying to identify, and this to me was the most difficult part to do, uh, to identify some sites where we could uh, uh, come up with an intervention within the city to capitalize off an opportunity where there was a, a class of architecture students who has also been uh, uh, doing a project in, uh, in the neighborhood of uh, Shibuya in Tokyo. There's a site that currently has a uh, uh, a public park on top of a parking garage uh, that they are developing into a museum uh, for a uh, for a, a, a particular uh, artist from Japan, and uh, so we're trying to find ways to kind of capitalize off of that opportunity, and uh, you know with further investments in the city. Uh, so what I'll talk to you about here is uh, first I'm going to go through uh, my uh, uh, the paper the the research that I did uh, before going uh, to Japan, and then I'll talk to you uh, uh, very briefly about the intervention that we're we're still currently working on. Um, and uh, but kind of frame it a little bit with the the challenge that we have with kind of going to a new country and in trying to do this and then uh, the third thing I want to show you and I'll, I'll have a little couple quick clips that I want to show you for my project of, of visualizing the city in time um, so my theory paper uh, I was focusing on the unique history of political activism in and around uh, Tokyo's train stations and in particular uh, the uh, Shinjuku station which have these really really interesting history of uh, a, a politi of kind of radical political protest um, and uh, a primary source uh, for uh, the re for, for this paper was some uh, uh, research uh, that was published by Peter Eckersall, who's an associate professor at the University of Melbourne, Australia, on kind of the history of the Shinjuku concerts uh, in 1969, and then uh, a discussion of the uh, documentary film uh, Chikatetsu Hiroba, Underground Plaza, which is, was a documentary film that presented uh, this, these events kind of from a little bit of the perspective of the people participating in it. And then I was trying to tie uh, these events back in 1969 to uh, kind of an ongoing uh, debate over the use of these train stations as kind of an efficient uh, public passageway, if you will, or a, or, or a kind of a public plaza space and uh, uh, relating it with some events that have happened much more recently um, in and around these train stations. Uh, so in 1969, there were these uh, activists and students uh, who were protesting Vietnam, and they were uh, they dubbed themselves as folk guerrillas, and they uh, blocked the uh, passageway near the uh, called the Underground Plaza near Shinjuku Station's west exit. Um, uh, during several months, and they were singing folk songs and giving uh, political speeches. And uh, this was not the first. Um, this was not the the, the first uh, sort of political uh, protest to take place in a train station in Japan. But this was a particularly memorable one and a particularly effective one, uh, because for one reason, Shinjuku train station is this huge, extremely busy, important transit node within Tokyo. Um, I visited here. I got lost in it. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And uh, actually, and uh, just to give you a sense, in uh, 2008 numbers, 
this was the world's busiest train station as far as the number of passengers who travel through, and it had a daily average of 3.64 million uh, passengers. Uh, so in 1969, when they were blocking these passageways for these protests, they were able to kind of uh, get their political message out across the city to this very large uh, cross-section of the population very quickly and very effectively. Um, and there's a couple, uh, an another kind of important context for why these, uh, perhaps why these stations were used as, uh, as, as places for political protest back in the 60s, and, and we still see signs of this today, was that uh, post the, during the post-war kind of development of these train networks, at the same time, uh, the, the, this kind of grew up with the development of this post-war consumer economy in Japan. And uh, we still very much saw this when we were walking around. There's advertisements, video advertisements on the rail cars, uh, department stores built on top of or inside uh, the train station. Sometimes there's, there's the, you know stores and restaurants, cafes for ticketed passengers only. Um, and uh, as we saw uh, around these train stations, uh, these big transit nodes are, are kind of have uh, developed along with very popular, big, successful uh, retail um, uh, shopping areas around them. Um, so. Um, these kind of radical activists in the 60s actually saw that this post-war, or actually saw that this uh, uh, promotion of consumerism by the government was, you know, in some way uh, a way of distracting people from uh, getting involved in and thinking about kind of uh, public debate. Um, so uh, there's this really interesting uh, uh, narration within the film that, that, that's up here uh, where the filmmaker uh, kind of uh, relates what the activists are trying to do here with uh, the idea of the Greek agora, which is this gathering place, this public place where everybody goes to hear the news and, and, and hear speeches and essentially to uh, take part in a democratic uh, debate. And uh, these, what these activists were doing, they weren't just kind of you know, giving their own speeches and trying to portray their own agenda out to everybody, but they were kind of actively, and it's seen in the film, they're actively trying to uh, uh, recruit people into this conversation and kind of talking about not one subject but all of these different um, issues and everything that are on their minds and having this very open, very kind of haphazard debate. So what the filmmaker, what, what the, the documentary film tries to show is that there's a, there, the kind of the main goals of these uh, protesters are really to um, uh, kind of show to present to the public the value of using uh, spaces like these train stations for public debate uh, and really turn this station into an agora. Um, however, uh, the documentary film about these events ends with railroad police coming in and removing the protesters uh, and uh, there's a, there was a, a plaque um, in the station that it labels it Underground Plaza. They put a quick handwritten note over it that uh, basically um, changes the name from plaza to underground passageway. Um, and uh, the, but um, when looking at kind of a number of more recent um, kind of protest events in and around, uh, in and around Shinjuku Station and also other uh, train stations in the network, um, these continue to be, uh, these continue to play, uh, Tokyo's underground continues to play a very important role in uh, political and community activism. A few examples of this, uh, in 1995 and 1996, there was the uh, Shinjuku cardboard, ha uh, cardboard House Art Movement in which uh, police were trying to evict homeless people from dwelling within Shinjuku's uh, underground plaza and artists came around and uh, painted on their cardboard homes to, uh, you know, in protest to tell people, uh, make, make everybody aware of the eviction. Um, and then in uh, 2005, there was a, a march called the Memorial Walking Care, in which uh, there was uh, survivors and families of a uh, 1995 sarin gas attack that uh, hit uh, five subway trains in Tokyo. And uh, this march in 2005, in remembrance of that event, uh, walked along the streets above ground, but it did so um, above all, each of the train lines that were affected. 
so, and, and then here, this is a photo here actually, we were only in uh, uh, Shibuya for I think four days out of the trip and on the second day I walked out of the station and uh, I'm not sure what he was protesting but this gentleman was uh, kind of standing up here in a, in a military uniform with a flag on top of a van, he had a megaphone and he was uh, uh, clearly giving some uh, uh, sort of political speech to the passers-by. So even just there for a short period of time, I was it was neat that I was able to kind of see that uh, this these uh, train stations are still kind of being used in this way um, uh, for kind of political uh, performance. Um, so in a way, what I try to talk about in my paper is uh, that while these stations focus as these important transit nodes, uh, at, they're also kind of functioning as important community assets uh, for democracy, for political debate. Uh, kind of their, people are turning them into informal um, uh, public spaces since these are really uh, you know, kind of destinations in their own right. Um, so that kind of relates to, however, the struggle that I had with then, you know, researching and reading and everything from afar and going and traveling to Tokyo and finding that everything is much more complex than it seems <laughs> before you go. Um, so one of the, as I said, we're still all kind of working and struggling with our interventions and everything, but um, one thing I wanted to do since the, uh, the the project uh, for the museum site that the architecture uh, students are working on uh, is in a site that currently has a community park uh, which we went and visited. It's, it's, it, it's, it's quite beautiful and, and it was definitely being used while we were there. Uh, is to, I wanted to, I, I, I identified a site that I wanted to propose a, uh, a new uh, public plaza that could also kind of uh, function as a uh, public performance space. Um, and you know the the difficulty that I've been struggling with here is, you know, on, on, on the one hand, uh, from my research, it would see uh, from kind of doing this reading and everything about how people have kind of informally used these train stations, how do you, with a new plaza, kind of compete with how people are already using that train station? And, um, you know, will people, can you expect people to kind of use a space in, in the same way? Uh, but, at the, however, at the same time, I, I really began to, you know, question that kind of previous. Um, uh, the expectation that I had is, you know, kind of, you know, perhaps too much of a generalization because as we went around Tokyo and to different districts and everything, there was some just a wide variety of these very vibrant public spaces because it's such a kind of uh, highly mobile and, and kind of pedestrian friendly city everywhere we were going. Um, that uh, and it was really interesting to see and kind of hear from some locals as well. Um, kind of the dip, just the. Um, the different roles and the different functions that all these different uh, spaces use as well. And while, you know, my paper was kind of looking at these informal um, uh, uses, uh, kind of creation of their own kind of public space or agoras, there's a lot of, uh, you know, very well functioning uh, kind of formal public spaces for that that we saw as well. So um, this leads me to uh, my, uh, my project to visualize a city in time. And uh, what I was trying to do here um, was uh, take a look at, uh, I wanted to do a, a video and kind of take a look at the uh, get out on the streets of Tokyo and also go to um, a number of different uh, uh, districts and some of these public spaces that we saw such as Ueno Park and a um, uh, and a, a street market that I'll show you here and um, show the, uh, uh, and I edited together kind of from uh, morning to night and then morning again to kind of show the passage of time throughout about 24 hours. And uh, coming back and visiting all these different sites at different times of day, I thought was really informative just to kind of see how the character of the city transforms throughout the day. And what I tried to do in the video was um, kind of explore a number of the different themes that we all looked at before taking the trip. So, I mean, because of time, I'm just gonna show you a quick little, um, I'm just gonna show a quick little clip here. Uh, this was actually one of the kind of on the theme of uh, public spaces and their relation to the to the, the train network. This was to me this is one of my favorite spaces that we visited. It's really fascinating. There's uh, right up there on the very top there that's an elevated train line and they built this uh, it's kind of it's informal looking but it's a formal market that uh, has been built within alleyways on both sides of the elevated train line and also under the train line. Um, and uh, kind of but at, at the 
the kind of the pedestrian street level here, it's almost, you don't even notice that's there because it's just, it, it works beautifully. But I thought that was really interesting. So uh, this, what this clip here is showing, it's going to show a little bit about this, a little bit of this uh, street market, which I thought was a really interesting uh, public space. And then uh, that uh, shows a transition into night to kind of show the, the neon nightlife in uh, Shinjuku and uh, Shibuya. And then transitions again to uh, morning. Just a sense of, the, it's a five minute video all together. And here's just Um, thank you. That's going to be, I'm going to send around to everybody on Vimeo and everything. So it just kind of gives you a, a nice little sense, I think, of the, uh, um, our observations and everything as we were kind of traveling through the city and gives you a nice, uh, uh, I hope, uh, experience that's kind of fun to, to watch. So uh, thank you very much. Um, for the two people that went to Tokyo, I'm wondering if you guys were able to apply the same um, 
observations, I guess, to another area in Japan? Like, did you guys visit another location that wasn't as dense and we, didn't have those same characteristics, like uh, urbanism around the train station or love hotel? Um, we did spend um, the last tail end of our trip in Kyoto, and Kyoto is very traditional, and it's a low city, um, so that none of the skyscrapers, none of the screaming signage that you would typically see yeah. in Tokyo. So um, they, they actually they have uh, uh, in Kyoto they have these uh, building height regulations because mm -hmm. there's so many. It is the the town was the fascinating thing about about Kyoto, which I loved, was that mm -hmm. there was just so many. We visited uh, you know quite a handful of them. Uh, so many of these kind of uh, just ancient uh, uh, Buddhist temples and Shinto shrines. I mean, not ancient. Some of them are kind of rebuilt, <laughs> right. but um, there's. Uh, but yeah, they have. It has the the whole city looks and feels very differently because they have these building height regulations, so that it's so that you know when you're sit when you're in uh, one of the the shrines or the temple grounds within the middle of the city, you're you don't have buildings surrounding you, kind of blocking the. Just the kind yeah. of the, the serenity, the isolation, and beauty of the place. Right. You don't want to take yeah. away from that. I mean, yeah. uh, besides the, the physicality of the city, work, did it have the same like infill under the train station and this whole concept of um, the train station disappearing even though it's overhead, mm -hmm. or the idea of leaving your house to go have some luxury <laughs> time, you know, with your spouse or right. your um, I personally didn't see any love hotels in Kyoto. Um, it, it, it definitely had a more um, a more traditional feel to it, um, but but the you know it, it it the way it's kind of it's much much of it is really a much uh, kind of a, a more formal grid throughout it, so it, it has a different feel. But still, there were uh, one of the things that we found. They were very similar in both uh, Kyoto and in Tokyo with these little, um, and there's a, I have a couple shots of one in my video, but there's these little uh, alleyways with these mm -hmm. barlets um, or sometimes small little districts like Golden Guy in, in Shinjuku that are really cool with just kind of a more um, uh, uh, typically kind of like two-story buildings, I would say, and these kind of narrow alleyways that um, and they usually have kind of some sort of hanging lighting over them or something, and uh, and these are really neat little uh, kind of nightlife spots, but seem kind of you know quiet and isolated too. Um, and there was we saw those in Tokyo, and we did see those in um, in Kyoto as well. And these are in really really narrow little alleyways. In Kyoto, there's this really beautiful district that's along, I don't remember the name of the district now, but it's along a, it's along a canal river. that they yeah. have there and there's a little street right along the canal that we all walked through that was really cool. Right. So we did, when we were um, in, uh, but yeah, we were kind of doing and making some comparisons and, and everything with Tokyo. I would say that we did a lot more, you know, much more kind of detailed analysis of Tokyo because that's where the sites and the interventions were that we were right. looking at. Um, I, I wonder if, if each of you could just talk for one minute about about a, the same question, so that we can hear you more clearly about uh, about just everyone participating. And that is, if we we talk a lot about how your education here, your perceptions here, take ideas and put them there. It's inevitable, right? You learn so much about intervention in the United States, and you're taking it to other places. I wonder if you brought back feedback loops where you now ask yourself the question: What did you distinctly see there? that shook your foundations about how you approach cities. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll go ahead and start. Um, it's a big question. Uh, I guess, to be fair, this wasn't my first trip to India. So I think had it been, I might have had sort of that more kind of foundational shake up and questioning how I perceive cities. Um, Varanasi in India itself is pretty unique and has a lot of characteristics that aren't found in a lot of other Indian cities. Um, but in terms of sort of how I come back to perceive how cities work, um, in some ways I feel like cities everywhere are sort of the same. <laughs> in that there are going to be problems, and a lot of those problems sort of boil down to, uh, to the people who are running the cities and the people who are living in the cities. And, how those people interact with each other, the levels of trust that are there, the ideas of responsibility, of agency. And I feel really lucky to be in cities of Los Angeles where 
you know, even if you don't think the city council is doing the best job or you think there's corruption happening, there are mechanisms in place that people can do something about that. And uh, those aren't problems unique to Varanasi, they're not problems unique to Los Angeles or other cities throughout the world, but I think it's the differences in what we're able to do to respond to those problems. And I think we're really lucky here in that we have a lot of things that we can do to respond to those problems uh, that unfortunately sort of maybe aren't as available in other cities and other countries. Uh, I, I'd answer in a similar way. I think, you know, part of my struggle here in, in learning and studying urban planning is to stay engaged and just really keep fighting, you know, I guess you could say the good fight. But, I mean, you run up against all these things that are, you know, barriers to plan, good planning. I mean, bureaucracy and the like, uh, politics, you know, community opposition, all the messiness that makes you want to go home and just say, you know, I give up. I, it's impossible. I'm just going to, you know, do, uh, maybe become a developer and just do one little project and that'll be it. You know, I forget the big picture. Uh, I'm calling it, I'm calling it quits. But you go over to India and they have all of these problems and then some. I mean, talk about bureaucratic problems. The, the caste system, uh, you know, as, as sad and unfortunate it is, is, is still kind of, you know, small living spaces, kind of small, you know, everything basically. And, and, um, you know, but yet then I remember walking around, we were actually, Winnie and I chatted with uh, someone who, uh, wa uh, who lived in Osaka, and we were in Kyoto, mm -hmm. in, near, in the garden near the Imperial Palace, and she was saying how, like, every weekend or every other weekend or once a month or something, she took the train from Osaka two hours to go to Kyoto to go visit the shrines and the gardens and everything, to go, to go walking and everything like that because it was a nicer place to walk. So, it, so I guess it, it kind of the sense of, you know, while, um, while I felt very hesitant at first to kind of pose questions or, you know, make suggestions or something about, you know, whether or not kind of, you know, there's ways to intervene or kind of, you know, Im improve cities or something like that. And, um, you know, but kind of when you actually talk to people and ask people and everything, there's, it, it, it's, it's a whole different thing. So, I don't know. I guess I felt a little bit less intimidated to kind of ask those questions or make those, those points, if that makes sense. All right. Thank Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. There were a few final words, I assume, and I'm wrap up this is always Well, I, I think it was really nice that the, it ended with the students talking, and uh, that was a really good question. What he said was, you know, what what are you guys learning and bringing from there? Uh, from your presentation, one of the things I loved about your presentation was there's a certain naivete to what you were saying. And I wanted to jump in and say, no, but that's not true, but it's actually wonderful that you have that kind of, like, what David was a good example, where you were, you were talking to the municipal commissioner and explaining to him. And, you know, if you were more kind of real, you said, I'm just a student, just a commissioner, and I'm very glad you didn't do that, right? So I think that's actually, in terms of the engaging the city, I think it's a wonderful attitude to have that you're constantly learning, you're open, that you don't know everything, which is what a lot of experts get cynical and jaded, which is so sad. Like, a lot of my friends already are like, I'm like they're done because wherever they go, they're close to ideas. So uh, I thought that was very, very nice that you have this kind of, even though uh, kind of sense of wonderment and understanding of uh, what's going on there and being, uh, even though it, it can be overwhelming. So that's one thing. The other thing was something that Vinny said, which struck me just now. You said, well, you thought Tokyo was chaotic. Uh, I would just temper that by saying, my definition of chaos is an order we don't understand. It's just a different order. And uh, a lot of people who go to these parts of the world first time say, oh, it's chaos, it's crowded, oh, it's, it's a mess. No, there are people who have been living like that for thousands of years, and maybe it's a logic and way of thinking that we don't know and we can learn from. And um, because, you know, I go back to India maybe every three, four years, so it's sort of interesting. I don't, I don't take it for granted. I remember one of my trips, I came back and I was like, wow, American cars are really big. And I don't mean the Cadillacs, I mean like the Toyota Camrys and Hondas. And because in India, at least that time, a few years ago, you know, everybody was driving these tiny Suzukis and everything. And, like, and I really started thinking, why are our cars so big? Are we such big-ass people that we need? 
you know, even with just one person in these gigantic cars. So, I mean, it just made me think in terms of, you know, what Vinay was saying, learning from those places, is do we really need such big cars and big roads? I mean, it just, so I would just encourage all of you to keep that kind of, you know, it is not really the same. I mean, just pay attention to the little differences. And I think it came out in all your presentations. And what can we learn from that? I mean, like your example of the Love Hotel, you know, it's, it's got this CD connotation and you showed some wonderful slides. No, it's just part of normal life. You know, that's uh, like in our practice, you know, we've dealt with, uh, what are they called, like adult uses, like, you know, adult video, and it was like, oh my God, that's terrible. No, it's just, I remember this slide I took one uh, in Seattle of this uh, art museum designed by Robert Venturi, which was very famous. And across the street was, this some years ago, was an X-rated cinema house. And I said, you know, that's what a city is. It's these wonderful, bizarre, amazing juxtapositions. And I think some of the cities that, you know, you, what you were describing, there's some really wonderful things going on, which brings a richness that sometimes we lose here if we, if we regiment things too much. You know, if we kind of separate uses, we, we control things too much. Uh, but it was great, I thought it was great that you ended with the students, but I think it's, it, this attitude of, you know, being open and learning is a wonderful attitude. So I just want to thank you. I just want to say uh, a minute of finale words here. So as I the end to this thing, we've exceeded by half an hour, which is actually a great. We have things to say. I just want to say thank you to everyone for coming. It's been a wonderful evening. I just want to say for the record, six years ago, five and a half years ago, we participated in another modest symposium uh, in Los Angeles called the Emerging Asian City. And five years later, a book emerged. So we are, we are finishing another symposium tonight. I don't know what I'm trying to say here, but let's keep this going. Thank you all. Have a good night.